Thanks, Melinda, and it's good to see everybody. Thanks for joining in. Uh, yep, as Melinda said, my name's Dave, and uh, excited to talk today about assessment and assessing our instructional practice, not necessarily always just thinking about assessing student learning or uh, student outcomes, but also thinking about how we assess what we do as instructors. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen. And if you could just give me a little indicator, a uh, reaction or a nod uh, on your screen, if you can see that, thank you. So welcome to Inclusive Teaching Strategies, How Do I Know It Works? And we're going to go through today a number of, oh, let's pull, first pull my toolbar off of that shared screen. There we go, so you can see things. We're going to go through a number of, uh, of outcomes that we hope you'll take from this workshop. First, that you'll be able to leave today being able to identify multiple forms of assessment uh, to help measure and evaluate the impact and effectiveness of instructional practice. Also, to consider the forms of assessment that might work best uh, in your course and your context, given the discipline, the modality, and your time constraints, what you can reasonably do. And then thinking about developing a plan for building assessments of instruction into your course, specifically thinking in this case about uh, inclusive teaching practices. But really, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is applicable across the board. Anytime you're thinking about the instruction you deliver and your instructional choices, how can we plan intentionally to collect data to be more informed about the impact that's having on our students? And there are many ways that we can think about assessment. It can be assessment of learning in, in an after the fact sort of sense. Uh, we see this in exams and projects and portfolios often in our courses in large papers that students might write. We can also think about assessment for learning. And that's the use of assessment to guide the learning process to allow students to monitor their own learning and to, to uh, provide opportunities and avenues for feedback that we can gauge how well students are doing and how they're progressing in the course. Quizzes, low stakes assessments, small activities and assignments, even student reflections that you might build into your course can be great opportunities to assess, uh, to use assessment for learning. And then today we're really going to focus on assessment of instruction or really measurement and evaluation ultimately of our instructional practice. But I want to start with a couple of questions, a few questions. What forms of assessment are available? What are our options? And really, what do we even choose to measure? How do we make those decisions? And today we're going to go through the process of uh, learning about how we really systematically determine uh, a process for, for making decisions about collecting data uh, from our course and building new opportunities for data collection into our course to learn more about what we're doing uh, to support our students. First question is, what is it that we really want to assess? And I noted earlier, we're going to focus on assessment of instruction. And as we think about this in more detail, we're, we're really focusing on the impact and effectiveness of our instructional choices really in this, uh, in this session regarding inclusive strategies and inclusive approaches and practices. So I'd like to take a break from talking and ask you, and uh, if you're in a situation where you can do this, if you've got a, a separate device or you're at a computer, um, if you're able, visit pollev.com slash dsovic365 or just scan that QR code on the screen. And I want you to just share one or more terms that come to mind when you see or hear inclusive teaching. Take your time on that, uh, gain access to that poll everywhere uh, platform and just share what one, two words come to mind when you see or hear inclusive teaching. And you can see these coming in. So we've got equity, culture, belonging, equitable, grading, Accessibility, culture, great. Fairness and fair, okay. So inviting, it's interesting. Different styles, respect and respectful. These are great, keep them coming in. 
because we're going to be using these types of, of, of terms, these concepts, to think about how we define inclusive teaching. What is it? How do we capture uh, what inclusive teaching is? And that can allow us a, a clearer path moving forward in selecting strategies and then thinking about what it is that we really want to assess about our um, attempts to create these inclusive environments. Great, thank you. Yep, community, family. Welcoming. It's great to see where your minds go uh, when you think about inclusive teaching. So just take a moment to look over that word cloud, think about some of those terms and maybe how they connect to what you do or what you attempt to do in the classroom. And then again, we'll use this as we move forward in thinking, uh, thinking about our approach to assessment. So here's where we'll start. And it is defining the construct. What is inclusive teaching and what does it look like in practice? That's what we'll do first. And then we'll spend the majority of our time applying a sort of backward design approach where we're going to think about what outcomes are we interested in? What is it that we're trying to measure? What is it that we're looking for as a result of these instructional choices we're making and these instructional design decisions? And then move forward with identifying the options that we have to measure those outcomes and outcome achievement. And that, that may be for the students, that may be something about our own uh, instruction. But starting with defining the construct and we turn to the literature and what does the literature say about inclusive teaching and it says a lot, certainly, this is one example, a 2017 uh, literature review, a synthesis of recent literature moving toward inclusive learning and teaching by Lori et al. And in this particular publication, you see a number of elements associated with inclusive teaching that were identified in that review of the literature that inclusive pedagogies enable accessibility that they meet diverse student needs. They help to avoid barriers to learning and they're multimodal and flexible in terms of their assessments that they use. These are all elements that were consistently seen in the literature around inclusive teaching and that publication used this Hawking's 2010 definition that really was in parallel with their findings. Inclusive learning and teaching in higher education refers to the ways in which pedagogy, curricula, and assessment are designed to engage students in learning that is meaningful, relevant, and accessible to all. Now, there is much more, really, that goes into inclusive teaching, and there are uh, different components of inclusive approaches that we could spend time on in this session, but we're going to focus on this as our overarching definition of inclusive teaching and what it really looks like in practice. And so with that in mind, I said we're going to spend most of the time thinking about how we apply this backward design approach. What are our outcomes and what are the options that we have to measure those outcomes for our students and for ourselves? Going back to the different forms of assessment, we might start with student performance data. It's simple, straightforward, and it's something that we typically all have and already in place. But what can student performance tell us about our inclusive teaching strategies and approaches? And I think it can tell us a lot in a lot of cases, but in your experience, what are some possible reasons that underlie students performing poorly on something like an exam? And I'd love it if you'd be willing to share your thoughts to the chat. Um, no rush. Take your time to think about this. Let's take a minute or so, but feel free to submit those to the chat at any time. What are some possible things? What, what are things that you've seen that have happened in the courses that you teach that seem to be behind uh, students performing poorly on an exam? Thanks, Kristen. A lack of familiarity with the exam format. What prior experience do our students have? What sort of training or experience do they have with what 
it takes what, what an exam is going to be, how to prepare for it, poor study skills, not knowing how to study. Jennifer, thank you. Many of our students come to us with excellent study skills, but many come fully lacking an awareness of how to go about effectively studying. Metacognitive skills, thanks Melinda. They don't know how to learn study. They don't have those metacognitive abilities, the awareness and the knowledge in place, and they may need those supports to be more effective. Insufficient preparation and not knowing how to prepare in some cases, don't know what to study. And that can be as much our fault as anything else, right? Not clarifying expectations, poorly constructed exams, another one that falls on us, absolutely. Outside pressures, other uh, elements of life that get in the way of their ability to uh, successfully prepare. What about the format of the exam? Test anxiety, thank you, Brielle. Test anxiety, a stereotype threat. If they are experiencing these emotions and these anxieties, we know that to contribute to decreased performance. And for many of our students, these can be piling on. Right? It might not be one thing, it may be a variety of elements and issues at work that lead to that one grade, that poor performance on that one exam that one day, and it ne is not necessarily a reflection of the learning that's occurred. And that is one element that we could talk about in depth, uh, how we structure our assessments and how we structure our grading in the course, uh, how we measure learning and how we allow students opportunities to to document the learning that's occur occurred. So thanks everyone for all those ideas. You're all on top of this and I can tell. So it's, it's great to see you here and get your collective thoughts. I want you to consider this though. And, and maybe this is something that's gonna be very familiar to you, but I just wanna make sure that you've had a chance to think about um, assessment and assessment of student learning. So I'm gonna give an example, and the example is in the context of an instructor teaching a course in educational theory. And you had you don't need to know anything about educational theory uh, to go through this exercise, but just let's say that you're teaching this course in educational theory, and there are three exam items listed. Which to you seems to be the most effective assessment of student achievement or learning? There's no right or wrong answer here. Just in your mind as you read these, which seems to be the most effective assessment of student achievement or learning for this course in educational theory. The first example, assessment item one, positive reinforcement is an important element associated with which major theory of learning? That's a, certainly an item that could show up on an exam in a learning theory course. Uh, a, a, example item two, explain how a constructivist might differ from a behaviorist in planning a lesson on driving a car. And then three, using appropriate learning theory, create a lecture or learning session plan that's designed to support students in safely driving through a busy residential neighborhood. So A, B, or C, one, two, or three, what do you think is the most uh, effective measure of student learning? Have a couple initial votes for C. And you can also put in not quite sure if you don't have a clear choice. Oftentimes I'll include an option D, it depends. B or C, B or C, okay. Depending on student level, thanks Brielle. Thanks Nicole, it depends on learning objectives or our learning outcomes for the course, right? And as you vote C, and I will in, be in full agreement, if you're looking to measure learning, C represents the highest level of learning among these three items. However, I'd qualify that with, in this course, if I haven't told my students that the expectation is they can use learning theory to create something new, would this be a a sound measure, a sound assessment item for the course. And in that case, maybe not. What if the learning outcome for the course is that students will be able to identify the primary elements of five popular theories of learning? In that case, what do you think? A, B, or C? Which would be the most effective, the, the, the most effective assessment item? 
given this particular outcome? Shannon A, Josh A. We start to think about alignment, alignment between the outcomes that we have identified for our students and that hopefully that we've shared to our students and focused on and let them know this is what you'll be expected to do and this is what you're expected to learn and this is what is going to support you in moving forward in this course sequence and the discipline and whatever it is. Alignment between those outcomes and the assessment items that we create. In this case, if we're expecting students to identify these elements of popular learning theories, then it makes sense to ask them about those primary elements. It doesn't make sense to ask them to compare constructivists to behaviorists or necessarily to create lectures or learning sessions. Now, someone who can create an effective lecture using learning theory likely knows the important elements associated with the different theories. But that's not the expectation for this course. However, if our learning outcome for the course is that students can effectively use theories of learning in the development of student learning experiences, then absolutely C is going to be our item of choice. Yes, A and B would be pieces of that, but if we're using our assessments to give us evidence that students are achieving the outcomes, we're going to collect the, the best evidence in this case if the students are asked to create something using what they know about these uh, appropriate learning theories. So this really speaks to alignment, alignment between our outcomes and our assessments. And you can see outcome number two, for example, students will be able to compare the adoption of multiple theories of learning and designing instructional experiences. This doesn't say that they can or they're prepared to or they have been prepared to design those experiences, but they hopefully have had practice in and have been supported in comparing the adoption of these different theories of learning. And in that case, it makes total sense to ask, ask the students to explain how a constructivist might differ from a behaviorist in planning that lesson on driving a car. And so I just wanted to use that exercise to get you thinking about alignment and about the different levels at which we ask students to demonstrate learning. And Bloom's taxonomy, if you're not familiar with it, is a really popular and often referred to and used and referenced uh, taxonomy hierarchy of learning in instructional design and assessment used often in those in those uh, areas. You can see here it's shaped like a triangle or a pyramid uh, that really doesn't matter, but it is a, a, a an adequate representation of the hierarchy because remember or uh, remembering understanding you can see these this hierarchy builds as it goes up in complexity. At the sort of foundational level, students recall facts and basic concepts. They can identify, let's say, at the understand level or the remember level, they can identify those different elements associated with the major theories of learning. You're setting an expectation in that case that students are performing at low levels, uh, low cognitive levels. Still important, critical to build that knowledge base so they can do those upper level uh, tasks. But not the upper level task. Whereas in other courses, if the outcome states that they can or are expected to perform at upper levels, higher order thinking, then we might ask the students to analyze, to evaluate, to create on our assessments. But we want to make sure in doing that, that we're preparing the students effectively, giving them appropriate practice and also clarifying to them that that is the expectation. Yeah, I talk to my students a lot about uh, if they've been extremely successful all the way through high school and they're coming in as an introductory freshman. Something that very likely they've done is effectively use flashcards and many of those students probably did that and were successful in doing that all the way up through graduation of high school and they received A's and B's in their courses uh, using that learning strategy. And in my course, if my expectation now suddenly is that they're applying information and they're able to analyze information and break that down into its component parts and then answer questions about it, flashcards get them to the first and second level. And so when I show my students this, I let them know the expectation here is beyond what you've expected in the past or been expected to demonstrate in the past, very likely. And many students 
who've had A's and B's their entire life come in as a freshman to college and suddenly experience a C or a D or worse on an exam and they don't know what happened. And in many cases, it's this. And I let my students know that the expectation may be that you're performing at a higher level and you need to adjust your strategies, your approaches uh, accordingly and learn new ways to study. So clarifying expectations to students is a critical and inclusive approach uh, that you might want to consider. If it's not that, if it's not expectations, maybe it's a misalignment. And so I just wanted to also point out that it's worthwhile to take an assessment of your, an evaluation of your uh, course components, critical course components, the learning outcomes, the assessment evaluation, and your instructional choices. All of those should work together and align such that you're preparing your students with the appropriate instructional choices, giving them the appropriate practice to perform on the assessments, and those assessments should measure what's expected as it's stated in the learning outcomes, this idea of constructive alignment. All right, so I'm not gonna ask you to report out on this, but think of an inclusive teaching strategy that you currently use or that you might use in the future. And you can, well, I guess I am asking, you can use the yes, no reactions uh, to submit your or submit to the chat. You don't have to, I want you thinking about this. Do you anticipate that successful use of that strategy would either directly or indirectly support student learning that's desired in your course. This could be one of your outcomes. As we think about this backward design process and assessing our instructional practices, this could be the start of one of defining one of your outcomes. Is it that students are supported in learning? If that's the case, then you might consider a review of your alignment of your course, looking at your learning outcomes, your assessments, and your inclusive strategies. Thinking about where you apply those inclusive strategies, if they're targeted for certain elements of the course, certain uh, content in the course, or if they're overarching. Are there particular assessments or assessment items that should be, students should be supported in performing on those assessments through the use of your inclusive strategy? And if that's the case, those assessments and a review of that assessment data might be appropriate. And so you identify those assessments that align to the inclusive strategies that you're using and analyze specifically those student performance indicators. In many cases, it might be summative data, an exam item or several exam items or an overall exam performance, a portfolio, uh, a paper that's been written, a presentation that's given. If you've intentionally infused inclusive strategies to support students in moving toward the development of skills and knowledge uh, needed for that performance, then that would be a great opportunity to assess what's happening. That's an outcome that you can actually measure because you have data coming from the assessments you use already in the course. Outside of student performance in the summative sense, you can also think about formative assessment responses. If, if some of the student performance data in terms of summative assessment is at the end, right? You're measuring learning after it's occurred on that exam, on that paper, on that portfolio. The formative assessment techniques measure learning as it occurs. It's kind of that assessment for learning, the low stakes quizzes, activities that happen in the class, ass small assignments, weekly reflections that you might ask your students to, to provide. There's data there as well that can help us uh, to assess and then ultimately evaluate our instructional practice in terms of inclusive teaching. A few examples from the literature, in this case linked to student motivation, motivating all of our students using formative assessment, formative assessment techniques. And I'm going to focus in on one of these, this, this Colley and Macmillan paper uh, from 2010 formative assessment techniques to support student motivation and achievement. There are some really great resources in this particular literature uh, piece, and I'd encourage you to take a look if you're interested. But they define formative assessment as a process through which assessment elicited evidence of student learning is gathered. And, and this is key to effective formative assessment, instruction is modified in response to feedback. And not only instruction is modified, but also student behaviors can be modified because formative assessment provides feedback both to the instructor and to the student. Colley and McMillan used this formative assessment cycle, and I like this figure, 
where you have ongoing assessment occurring in a formative sense happening in the class, you're collecting these reflections, you're listening in on student conversations, you're assigning small activities, the group work, whatever it might be. You collect that and provide feedback. And that doesn't necessarily have to be you taking a look at every single paper or every single reflection, right? There are ways, let's say in a larger class to collect through automated uh, response systems, something like Top Hat, if you're, if you're familiar with it, or Turning Point, some technology-based platform that allows students to answer questions and it allows you to collect immediate feedback. And there are low tech options for that as well, right? Students raising up cards in response to questions posed, and you can get a sense of uh, the responses and the proportion of your students who are responding correctly versus incorrectly. And you can provide the instructional correctives and feedback in real time or shortly after you've collected that, that assignment. That impacts then student motivation and in this in this particular study they, they demonstrated that this cycle providing those correctives and allowing students an opportunity to respond to the feedback impacts in a positive way student motivation. And that in turn impacts ongoing student engagement engagement their work and their achievement in the course, which then can be bolstered even more by further assessment further feedback further correctives on the part of the instructor and the student further contributing to uh, increased motivation. And so this cycle can continue as long as you have that ongoing assessment occurring in your course. There were five key practices in this one uh, that were identified. I won't spend time on those, but I really do recommend that you check this out for information and for some really clear and specific examples that you could potentially use to guide formative assessment in your course. Another opportunity for formative assessment that's really easy to implement and that is uh, can can be done in a very inclusive way. Classroom assessment techniques or cats are referenced often in the literature. They date back to around, I think, the early 90s and I've got a, a literature reference there in just a little bit to clue you in on where they were initially coined. In using something like a classroom assessment technique and I'll give you the list of, of different techniques you might use in, in a moment. You're going to think about questions for which feedback should aid student learning if you'd give effective feedback that should help the students to be more effective in their learning. Make sure that the task you're asking is manageable. Both in terms of what you're asking the students to demonstrate in terms of their learning in that moment and also the time that you have. Certain classroom assessment techniques like a concept map might take a lot of time, whereas a minute paper takes literally a minute. Plan the approach to how you're going to analyze that those data. Right? Maybe if you have uh, short answer responses, you'll run through those or a subset, a random sampling of those if you have a large group of students, and then group those responses by quality or accuracy. Maybe you will do a more in-depth analysis of a small number of written reflections and identify major themes and get counts of the themes and then go back into more responses if you haven't gone through them all and ensure that you're seeing those themes uh, in the additional responses that you analyze. Whatever, print, whatever approach you take to analysis, make sure that you follow up. If, if you're asking students to provide these data to go through these exercises and then they never see anything back, that's not gonna have that power of the cycle as demonstrated in that last uh, literature piece. How will you use the insights and how can students use that feedback? Give them that feedback and give them guidance on how they can take advantage of what you are letting them know about their learning. Example classroom assessment techniques that you might be interested in. You can see more of these in the Angelo and Cross 1993 paper, Classroom Assessment Techniques, Handbook for College Teachers. Uh, also, there's a site down there and I believe that we you'll have the access to this recording and I think these slides can probably be shared Melinda can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, great thanks Melinda uh, so you can you can find those links to example classroom assessment techniques, you can also Google classroom assessment techniques and simply find a wealth of resources. Uh, I know in one of my recent searches I saw a great site that listed 50. Uh, classroom assessment techniques that you could use in your course. Many of these are very short, very targeted, and really supportive of student learning in a formative way. So 
if you're using formative assessment, if your, if your inclusive approaches involve maybe formative assessment and formative assessment techniques, identify the strategies that are linked, that align, review those student responses, identify areas where students are struggling, where maybe existing misconceptions exist, where you're perceiving there to be barriers based on what you're finding in those uh, submissions. Do a basic qualitative analysis. There's no expectation, and you shouldn't have the expectation for yourself that you're going to do a manuscript worthy analysis. If you can't get through every student response, that's okay. Use the data that you have and the time that you have to be more informed about what's happening across your students. Identify major themes and use those then when you come back to the students the next time. Or maybe use your learning management system to post an announcement with the results of your analysis and then some resources for support. If you identify some major themes that students are struggling with this piece, it's clear in their submissions that they aren't getting it, let them know what we talked about in the last lecture, in the last lab, in the last session that we were together. It seemed like there are still some misconceptions or, or confusions. I wanted to share some additional resources that would really be helpful for you in advance of the next time we meet. And then if you really are seeing those misconceptions or confusions, come back to that. Spend 10 minutes. Let your students know, hey, I saw this in your responses. And I want to make sure that you have clarity in what we talked about last time. So let's spend another 10 minutes. Come back to this and maybe approach it in a different way and give you an opportunity to ask questions. Because from what I saw in your submissions, and I tried to give feedback where I could or post feedback for everyone, whether that's the LMS or in that next session, here are the things that might help but make sure you follow up with students to complete that cycle. All right, before we move on to custom surveys or published scales, any questions about how you might use student performance data, whether in a summative or formative sense, in working to assess your instructional practice, your inclusive teaching strategies? Any questions at all? Don't hesitate to share those out in the, in the chat. We can always pause and come back to questions as you have them. So please do share to speak up uh, if you have anything that comes to mind. But we can move forward in thinking now about outside student performance, student perceptions, student perceptions of the learning that's happening and of their experience in your course. To measure student perceptions of maybe what you're doing in terms of creating inclusive environments or using inclusive strategies, it's important to know how that's working for the students and how they're perceiving that. So we can use custom surveys or published surveys and scales that can inform us about how we're supporting or how we're maybe creating unanticipated barriers for our students. So again, think of that inclusive strategy that you currently use or that you might use in the future. In this case, do you anticipate that successful use of that strategy would in any way directly or indirectly impact the student experience in the course? So think about that in your context. I think in most cases, if we're intentionally infusing our instruction with inclusive strategies, the expectation should be that we're going to improve the student's experience. And if that's the case, we can use things like custom surveys. We can run this through a platform such as Qualtrics or another survey platform that might be available to you. You can oftentimes run these through your learning management system. In a, in a quiz or assignment, you can use, use rapid response technologies if you have those available. But asking the students about their experience with the strategies you're using, do they feel that they're being supported? And do they feel that they're, those strategies are helping them to learn? An example or, or a sample tool that you might be interested in is the SAUG survey. This is the student assessment of their learning gains. This dates back to, I believe, around the year 2000 at an uh, American Chemistry Society symposium or something similar to that, if I recall correctly. And this is a validated tool available to all instructors through this particular website, salgsite.net. You would have to register an account with the site, but then you have in place a platform to develop 
these custom surveys. And the SAUG itself is structured first targeting the learning outcomes that are defined for the course. It asks students on a Likert scale to respond to a series of items that ask their perceptions of being supported in achieving the outcomes for the course. And so if one of my outcomes in biology is that students can identify the major classes of macromolecules, this survey would start by asking them on a Likert scale from not at all supported to highly supported, how do they feel they were supported in achieving that particular outcome and the outcome stated for them and that every outcome defined for the course is listed. It allows the students an opportunity actually to practice metacognition, to think back on their experience, to think about what experiences they had that were aligned to that outcome and that supported their learning, if any, and allows them to think back to their experience in learning and gauge that on a scale. I could actually argue this is a worthwhile assignment for points in the course to motivate students to engage with it because you are supporting them in, in undertaking that metacognitive exercise and thinking back across their full experiences in the course and how they were supported or, or lacked support in achieving those outcomes. Then this survey, this tool also gives you the opportunity to create any other item that might be of interest to you. Are you interested in how a particular strategy you used impacted their sense of belonging in the course or helped them to learn one particular concept? Maybe there was something about how you developed and created your groups in a group activity that was evidence-based from the literature surrounding inclusive teaching. In that case, you might ask the students about their experience in that group setting and if that approach helped them in learning or created any barriers to learning and, and to their achievement in the course. So this is a nice tool that's available to anyone and can be deployed relatively easily um, as a survey instrument for your students. Tips for constructing survey items. If you've never written any survey items, there are some uh, common mistakes that can be made uh, something like leading the survey participants. Try not to lead them to an answer, lead them to a response. Work to ensure clarity given the different responses that are available. Avoid asking about two unrelated elements in the same item. That's something that often shows up and students have a hard time responding. Participants, any participant in a survey can have a difficult time effectively responding to an item if it's asking two different things that maybe they would respond to differently. Were you engaged and excited about the topic? Were you engaged with the exercise and uh, comfortable in the group? All right, well, maybe they were engaged, but they didn't feel comfortable. Make sure you're asking about one element at a time. Use simple and easily understood language and try to keep it concise. And so keep these in mind, take a moment to read through these. I'm going to ask you uh, for your thoughts on a series of items and how they might be able to be improved. So take just a moment and read over those tips. And take a look now one at a time and let me know either in the chat or feel free to just jump in. How might you improve these items? First, the group project was the best part of the course. What might be an issue with that and how might it be improved? Of those tips that were shared, which does this connect to? So this is Cheryl, and I have to admit, even though um, I probably know it can be improved, 
I still like the question. <laughs> well, it's exciting. And you hope that your group pot project might have been the best part of the course, right, Cheryl? Thanks for that. Right. But it is kind of leading. It is kind of leading, right? This project was the best part of the course. Also, clarity. So who is that? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my mouse in the right place. Shannon, thank you. Uh, does it mean they liked it or they learned something? What is it that you're trying to measure? Best is open and it's not necessarily clear what that means. So if you get that back, if you find that every one of your students said the group project was the best part of the course, what does that tell you? Does it tell you that they learned anything in that group project? Or maybe the way it was structured, they had a great time talking about something completely unrelated for those 30 minutes every every class session. Um, and ultimately, the learning didn't really occur, right? It may have been a lot of fun. And maybe there were other elements that were supported in that group project outside of learning, right? Maybe that created a sense of community in the, with the students. Maybe it helped with their sense of belonging or their, or, their, or their feeling of being a part of the discipline. That might be the case, but we're not measuring that here, right? We're measuring that simply they thought it was the best part of the course. What about, what about this one? The breakout room activities were well organized and engaging. What's the problem with that item? That one is double barrel. It could be well organized, but really horrible. Absolutely. It could be engaging and a chaotic mess. <laughs> Absolutely, Cheryl. Thank you. Yeah. And it's very easy to just break those apart, right? How did you feel about the organization of the breakout rooms? Did you find the breakout rooms to be engaging? Simply separating those out will give you a better picture of what's happening with that breakout room exercise. The next one, pedagogical strategies used for instruction were aligned to the CLOs. Think about asking that to your students. It's good to know, but as a student, if you read that item, what's going to be your immediate, immediate response? I seem to be on a roll, so I'm just going to go with it. Thank you. <laughs> It, the, the pedagogical strategies is a bit of jargon. Yeah. And so I'm not sure students really know what it means. And then SLOs, again, right. maybe they, they may or may not know what you're referencing. Absolutely. Yeah, Josh, what's a CLO? Yeah, I, unless this is a course where you very intentionally brought up this language many times and the students are very familiar with it. If I ask this to my biology students, they're not gonna know how to respond, right? Pedagogical strategy. I didn't even know how to pronounce the word pedagogical for a long time. CLOs uh, and even using those, those uh, abbreviations in the items can, can be a mistake, right? Course learning outcomes. So the strategies I used for instruction were aligned to the course learning outcomes. Even that, right, isn't necessarily something the students are going to realize. So asking maybe that in a different way. Asking them to reflect on, in this case, maybe it's not a survey item, maybe it's a reflection. Think back on your experience in the course. Think about the course learning outcomes that are listed. Where did you feel you were supported in achieving these course learning outcomes? What exercises do you remember that were really effective in helping you learn about these items or these topics or this content? That would be more appropriate, right? Relevant language, absolutely, Erica, thank you. And then finally, given an opportunity, I would suggest that a friend or acquaintance should consider signing up for this course next term. It would be nice to know, but what would be a better way to uh, to state something like that? Great point, Shannon. You don't know why the student would recommend the course. That would be a perfect opportunity for a short answer follow-up. 
So if you are collecting this liquor scale item, something in the form of, I would suggest this course to a friend. Then as a follow up, why would you or would you not recommend this course to a friend? Please explain. That way you have those liquor items that you can very quickly analyze across your students, but you can also go in and dig a bit deeper into the actual qualitative response. But this one is just unnecessarily wordy. And so it could be more concise. Uh, and if you think about your student population, you may have students that uh, English is, is a second language. And in that case, the more complex the structure of the statement, the more likely that there's going to be confusion about what it's asking. So be careful in structuring those survey items for those custom surveys. Try to avoid leading, ensure clarity given the different responses. You're asking one thing at a time in simple and easily understood language that's relevant to the students and try to keep it concise. Then use short answer response or short answer opportunities for the students to supplement those, let's say, liquor, item, liquor scale or liquor type items that you provide. Now, beyond custom surveys, there are other surveys and scales already developed and published for inclusive teaching and many uh, measures associated with inclusive teaching, like equity, belonging, transparency, or elements of universal design, if you're familiar with universal design for learning or UDL. I'll give you a couple of examples. You may not, you may or may not be familiar with the tilt framework transparency and learning and teaching. If you're not, I'd recommend taking a look at tilthighered.com. That's a website that's dedicated to really a framework that was published in peer review by Winklemas et al in 2016. And that reference will be at the end of the presentation. But that was an intervention that really supported underserved students, underrepresented and marginalized students in persisting uh, through development of a more transparent approach to simple assignments in the course. And there is an assignment template. The link is there for you. Uh, we can, uh, again, this will be available to you, so you'll be able to access that. The Tilt Higher Ed website, I'll qualify this. There's some, there are some dead links uh, that you might find, but there are some great resources. And I would encourage everyone to take a, just a, a brief moment to look at that transparent assignment template and consider working to make your assignments more transparent for students. Because in that particular study, and this was across many universities across disciplines, Instructors were asked to change two assignments in their course and by by applying the tilt framework. And in doing so, they saw measurable impact for all students in the equity equity related measures that were included in the study. You can see the tilt survey questions and there may be some items in that list of survey questions that you'd like to use in your course, but they saw measurable benefit for uh, equity based variables in that study for all students, but even more pronounced for those, uh, those demographics that of interest, the, the marginalized students, first generation, uh, students that are under, under, generally underrepresented in underrepresented groups. So I encourage you to use the TILT framework as an inclusive practice. Modify your assignments using that framework, uh, and that can, that can be a simple change that can have a very big impact on your students' experience in your course. Universal Design for Learning, uh, there's an ERIC full text document available uh, through the Davies, Shelley and Spooner 2013 article that lists a 51 item, I believe, survey. You could maybe draw items from that, I, unless you're just doing this for research, maybe. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using a 51 item survey for your students just to find out about uh, their experience with your efforts in Universal Design for Learning. But there may be some really interesting items that you'd be interested in, interested in asking or modifying for your students to assess what you're doing in the classroom. And then the inclusive teaching strategies inventory from Lombardi, uh, Volkovic and Salabars from 2015. 
That one can be accessed through the wisconsin.edu website, Inclusive Teaching Strategies Inventory, and you can get that in, in, inventory. And again, just consider maybe not using the entire inventory, but selecting out those items that would be most relevant to your needs and your interests. So those are only a few examples, but those are examples of something that you wouldn't have to create from, from scratch. Right? Other surveys and scales on inclusive teaching that have already been developed. So if student perceptions and experience, it's your anticipation, it's your prediction that those should be positively impacted by successful use of your instructional strategies, your inclusive strategies, then identify a published survey or scale or create a custom early, mid or late term survey to collect those data. What do the students think about their learning, about being supported in learning, or some other element of inclusive teaching, maybe their sense of belonging in the course, maybe their self-efficacy, uh, maybe their autonomy, maybe their, uh, their satisfaction with uh, the, uh, the language used, were you using culturally responsive practice? Any of those elements that, you, that, that you're targeting for your inclusive teaching would be worthwhile to just ask the students about their perceptions and their experience with it. Review those responses, find themes if they exist regarding their attitudes, their perceived barriers to learning maybe, or also the supportive elements of the instruction. Surveying the students isn't all about identifying what's wrong. Oftentimes it's identifying what's right. And so when you quantify the number of students commenting one way or another, similarly rating major themes, you can then follow up, just like with the formative assessment, now's the time to follow up with those students, especially if you're doing an earlier midterm survey. Come back to the students and let them know this is what I found. And these are the things that you're reporting to me are really working, and I'm going to make sure we keep doing those things. But I also recognize that you're having concerns about or experiencing barriers related to this element of the course or this element of my instruction. And you can come back to that saying, these unfortunately can't be changed. I can't change the time that the course happens. I can't change uh, the number of assessments because it's, it's dictated to me maybe. But I can address these things. Maybe there are some items, there, there are some issues that are brought up by your students that you could change. And to give you an example from my own experience, uh, at Ohio State, we have a service that is offered that allows an instructional consultant to come in and, and run one of these surveys early or midpoint of the term with our students, collect those data on what's helping them learn, what's creating barriers to learning, and what are some things they'd like to see changed. And I ran this as a graduate teaching assistant. I ran this as an instructor, anywhere from 20 students to 350, 400 students. And in one of those situations where I had 350 or 400 students, the, the consultant came in, I was asked to leave the room so they could just have that conversation with the students outside of me being present. And I was still standing within the earshot of the, the lecture hall, you know, I couldn't tell what was being said, but all of a sudden I heard this massive round of applause. And I thought in the moment, well, this could be something really good or it could be something really bad. And, and I didn't know at that point. And so in the follow up uh, with the consultant, Consultant later on, I, you know, I returned to the course and finished up the, the day after they were finished and had a follow up consultation with that consultant received the feedback and found that it was actually something really bad. Um, and the students were uh, voicing their their extreme satisfaction with someone uh, stating that they just really didn't like the pre lecture activities that I built into the course. And I had no idea that was happening. And I also realized that I had not conveyed to the students why I was using those exercises. And the point was, based on how learning works, to give the, the students simply a, an opportunity to see the terms. And I was using an online homework sort of quiz based platform that asked really fundamental questions that if the students would just open the book and look up that term, they'd answer the question. Right. I never shared that with the students. I just told them they had these pre lecture assignments and have them completed before they came to class and the students were Googling the questions, they were never opening the book, they were never accessing the online resources that we had. They were trying to Google the questions they were struggling with them they couldn't find the answers and they were all highly dissatisfied and finding this to be a complete waste of their time. And so what I was able to do was come back to the students the next 
lecture and say, you know, I heard the massive round of applause. Everybody really is, is in agreement that you don't like the pre-lecture exercises. Here's why we do those. This is how it connects to actually how your brain works and how learning works. And this is the point. And so what I can do now is I'm going to change up the way I'm asking these questions. I'm going to write specific questions for you. And it's going to say something like, turn to page 463. What's the boldface term, A, B, C, or D? And I'm doing this because I just want you to see the term. And that way, when you come to class, and that's on the, on the overhead or on the projector screen, you won't have to wrestle with that term for the first time. You'll already have overcome that initial cognitive uh, demand, and you'll be able to listen and learn more effectively. And after that, and I saw it in my student follow-up, I saw it in their comments, um, I heard it from them directly, they were very satisfied with that activity afterward. And so simply collecting that information was a major opportunity to improve my course that I would have had no idea otherwise had I not asked for that feedback. So I highly encourage you to think about an earlier midterm survey of your students, whether that's something you do on your own and asking for anonymous feedback or something you do through a, an assignment based activity, asking the students about what's helping them to learn, what's hindering their learning and what they'd like to see changed in the course and then follow them up. You might find some really interesting uh, nuggets that would be uh, key to making your course better. So again, I ask you to think of an inclusive strategy that you currently use or that you might use in the future. Would you find a record of your own thoughts or a colleague's notes and observations on the effectiveness of instruction to be interesting or value as you attempt to assess and evaluate the impact and effectiveness of your inclusive teaching practices? We often use, in the absence of an actual systematic approach to assessing our instruction, we often rely on our own observations and our sort of anecdotal uh, uh, notes to self. What worked? What didn't work? What seemed to go really well? What seemed to be helping the students? What did the students not seem to take too well to? We often rely on that in full and we can be very misguided. Uh, oftentimes what we think is working is not what's working for the students. And oftentimes what we think maybe isn't working well is working for the students. Sometimes they match up, but we're not going to know unless we use other sources of data. That said, your personal observations and colleague observations can also be a key piece. So we might also think about our own perceptions of what's happening in the course. And just as good practice, I would encourage everyone and I need to make sure I do more of this myself. After the end of every lecture, after the end of every instructional session or laboratory or whatever it is you're teaching, simply take two minutes to jot down for yourself what worked based on your observation. What needs changed? What are the small things? What's that one question that you've had a typo in for the last six terms and you've never remembered to correct it? Make a note and keep that reflective journal over time throughout the term and periodically come back to it. That can give you some really valuable information. At the end of the term, you have a fixed amount of time to make change. And you're going to be collecting, hopefully, these different lines of data. But one of your first tasks might be to go back through your reflective journal and look through what did I note about each of the lectures. And you'll find those little things that you can make the change really easily. Otherwise, you're never going to remember. Which lecture was it? Where was that slide? What was it that I needed to change? Make those notes for yourself. Uh, one of the one of my colleagues here at the Institute uses PowerPoint and uses the title slide and uses the note section to record those observations. Every time that presentation is given right at the end, jump back in, look at the notes section of the first slide and record the notes for next time. Before I start this, make this change or when I come back to this. Uh, these slides need reorganized or this particular activity didn't go so well. Maybe rethink how it's being presented. This is shown in the literature as well to be beneficial. You can see higher education 2005 and also uh, college teaching in 2015 using reflective processes. For the instructors 
uh, to improve the, the instruction that's happening. Something else that you might consider, inclusion by design, a survey of your syllabus and course design. This is a modified worksheet from yale.edu. It's, it's open to anyone. You can access this uh, for free. You can see, and it, it may be difficult on your screen to read this. It reads, this survey tool was designed for you to examine a particular syllabus and course design to get a broader perspective on inclusion in your actual teaching practices. We've organized this worksheet in three sections. One, the context and design of your course. Two, the text of your syllabus and course design. And three, the subtext of your syllabus. And you can work through this on your own and do your own self-assessment to get your perceptions of your syllabus, and your course design in terms of inclusion and inclusive practice. Great tool for you to apply to your course for another line of data, in addition to thinking about student performance, student perceptions of their learning and also of their experience. Finally, observations of instruction. And here from also Yale, uh, a number of protocols and tools that are available to you. Some require training. For instance, COPUS, the Classroom Observation Protocol for Undergraduate STEM. That one is a behavior-based uh, observation tool that breaks what happens during an uh, uh, instructional session down every two minutes and lists a variety of behaviors, both of the instructor and the students, and asks the observer to classify what's happening every two minutes. Note every observation of behavior that occurs in these two minute intervals, and it provides a nice output of data uh, for the uh, individual being observed. But that one takes some training. You know, others don't necessarily. And you can simply ask a colleague or uh, someone to come in and sit and watch what's happening in the class. Maybe you're interested in a particular approach that you're using that lecture or in that session ask someone to come in and just have an eye toward that that piece and give feedback what did they see in terms of how you presented that material what did they see in terms of the students response to that strategy but observations of instruction are another piece that you can use to build this evidence around what's working in your course so another approach if one of our outcomes is that uh, we're really looking to support our students in either their overall uh, experience in the course or maybe the learning that happens, these can be potential uh, sources of data. Your personal observations and colleague observations and reflection, or your personal observations and reflections and your colleague observations. Maintain that personal reflect reflective journal in which you record your own perceptions of instruction or schedule a colleague observation. Review monthly your reflections or at the end of each term or whenever it's, whenever it's convenient. Use the personal perceptions or observation data to supplement then the student performance analyses that you've done and the analysis of perceptions that, you, that you've completed. And then triangulate. Are you seeing consistency in what you observed and what you noted and what the students are conveying? Are you seeing maybe discrepancies in students saying they loved it but their performance is lacking. And maybe that's a structural piece that needs addressed. Maybe you've, you've structured an activity that the students really enjoy the environment, but it's not actually supporting them in achieving the outcomes that are defined for them in terms of learning. And so maybe there are adjustments that can be made to maintain the environment, but change the actual engagement that occurs. Identify and address those needs and gaps. Use the notes to guide I would recommend small but necessary changes to plans and materials each term. Don't try to overhaul everything that you do at once because it's going to be overwhelming and it's not going to get done. But identify those low hanging, the, the, the small changes that could be impactful. The really critical pieces that need changed that the students are voicing to you or that you've recognized. And maybe investigate areas of misalignment across those different data sources. If you are seeing students perceiving something very, very effective, but their performance indicates it's not, what might be going wrong? If you see something as dry and uh, in need of change, but students are responding well and performing, then maybe that's what's important. Maybe you should continue with that approach because it's supporting the students and it's having a high degree of success in supporting their achievement. So we're applying this backward design, defining the outcomes that we have, either student performance or in terms of student perceptions 
of their learning or of their experience in the course. Maybe there are measurable uh, constructs that we're interested in. Define what that is and then identify the opportunities we have to measure those outcomes through all the different types of things we just talked about. And then create your plan. And this can be pretty simple. I'm just going to give you a, a template table idea. Right? What's your focus? What's your challenge? What are the outcomes? And that's that first column. What's the source or sources? What are the sources of data that you might use? Is it going to be a classroom assessment technique, a minute paper that you're asking students at the end of each session? Tell me what was the one thing that resonated most with you that you remember from today? And maybe what's the one thing that you're not quite sure about? In a minute or less, state that, right? You can use those data sources to learn more about what's happening to your students or asking them those custom surveys about their experience with particular strategies you've used. What did they feel was supportive of their learning? What did they feel was creating barriers to learning? When are you gonna collect those data? Is it gonna be early in the term so you can respond to the students in that course? If it's collected at the end of the term and maybe it needs to be, maybe it's a strategy that takes them all the way through the term and you need to ask at the end of the term their perceptions of that overall experience. If that's the case, you really can only follow up with the next set of students. Now, a good practice is to take those data and let the students know. In the last course, I asked students these questions at the end of the term. Here's what I found. And these are the changes I'm going to make for you as the next round of students based on that feedback. And I hope at the end of the term, you'll share similar feedback so we can make appropriate changes for the next round of students so we can continue to improve. But if you do create something that's going to be collected early in the term or at the midpoint of the term, you can respond to those students in your course. And that can be a really powerful uh, way to, to, to show your students, not to just say, but to show your students you're listening to them, you care about their, their ideas, and that you're responsive to their needs. So when will those data be collected? What are the methods? Is it through a survey? Is it through student reflections? Is it your own reflection, reflective process? Is it through defined assessments in the course? Write those out for yourself and, and align, make sure all this is aligned and then think intentionally about how you're going to analyze those data in a way that's gonna be manageable for your time and in a way that's gonna be meaningful, but not overwhelming and, and um, un, uh, unattainable really because we could think about you know publishable approaches to analyzing all the student data and and maybe it's important to break it down by student demographic but maybe it's not it really depends on what your question is what's your focus what are your desired outcomes but we could we could go into detail and go into depth in our analysis and it would be something that would be great for a scholarship of teaching and learning or discipline-based education research study but it's too much when you're trying to make changes maybe between fall and spring term, right? So do so conduct the analysis that's appropriate and it's gonna give you meaningful, uh, meaningful opportunity to form conclusions or a significant opportunity to form conclusions regarding those data and make then iterative changes over time. All right, so that kind of brings us to the end of the session today. We've got time to come back to things, to talk about questions, but just to recap, Hopefully this has helped you in identifying multiple forms of assessment that can help measure and evaluate the impact and effectiveness of your instructional practices. Hopefully now you can consider the forms of assessment assessment that might work best in your course and in your context, given the discipline, the modality and your time constraints. And hopefully now this gives you a process by which you can develop that plan for building the assessments of instruction into your course. Again, many of those lines of data should already exist but maybe there are some really simple ways to include some new uh, opportunities to collect data on what's happening. So with that, I'm happy to take questions and appreciate everyone's engagement today and, uh, and would appreciate any questions and feedback that you have. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, yeah, and I think it's a, a great time for any comments and or reflections as well. Um, if you've used any of these techniques, uh, it might be a nice time too to share um, about those. Um, 
And, and I think Dave is making that connection over time and with robust assessment into scholarship of teaching and learning from a scholarly teaching approach. Um, so, so please do ask questions or share. And Dave, I'm going to share. I'm going to ask question <laughs> while people are thinking. Um, where where can you actually publish? Would you what, what would you say if if we do some great assessment on inclu inclusive teaching strategies and say want to share it with other others? What are, besides publications? What are some options? Well, yeah, um, absolutely. You want to the way I approach thinking about collection of data like this and, and trying out new strategies is really about what's your intent. What's the intent of uh, your use of those data, right? If your intent, if you are intentionally collecting data to be able to share that out more broadly, then you want to think about, okay, I want to be intentional about securing maybe IRB consent and, and making sure that you have the appropriate uh, uh, elements in place to be able to maybe go to a conference. Uh, share that in a poster or a conference conference presentation. Um, I know the Lilly Conference here in Ohio is a great opportunity to do that and to share out these uh, great instructional practices. But if your intention is simply evaluative for yourself, then setting up a departmental meeting, a meeting amongst colleagues to report out, maybe setting a community or establishing a community of like-minded uh, instructors that are trying out new things and sharing out what's happening and the impact that you're seeing in terms of student learning, that's certainly something uh, that, you could, that you could maybe lead and, and bring about then opportunities to learn about what your colleagues are doing and, what, and share out what you're doing to impact their approaches as well. I'm just gonna also pop in that if, if you do this type of assessment, uh, be sure and, and let people know about it in your um, retention or evaluation processes. So whether or not it's a tenure process, my guess is that you're asked to report out on your, your um, teaching and students learning. And I think this is a really great opportunity to say, okay, this is how I'm really thinking about what happens in my classroom. It's a great point, Melinda. And actually formalizing that into a plan, uh, uh, using a documented sort of table that I showed there at the end of the presentation, having that in place is a nice artifact to be able to demonstrate. So if you have that, and then maybe you've analyzed some of those data and you can show the, the sort of through line of, here's why, how I've planned this, and now here are the outcomes that I identified, the conclusions I formed, and now the changes that I'm making in 